But first, I wanted to thank everyone who subscribed to my channel because now I've gone over a thousand subscribers. It's taken a little over two years, which is longer than I expected, but now that my channel is starting to grow, hopefully the YouTube algorithm will start recommending my videos more and, and it'll be growing faster. And also now that I've reached a thousand subscribers, I should be able to get super chats and ads. I promise I'm not going to put a lot of ads in the middle of the videos because I don't want people turning off. For me, the message is more important than the money. And so if you ever feel like there's too many ads and complain, let me know. And, but I'm hoping to use super chats and do live streaming once I'm eligible. And that way you can ask me questions that I can answer while I'm discussing various physics topics. And so hopefully in the next couple weeks or month, I can start doing that. And I'll let you know in future videos. And for those who watch me regularly, you may realize that I haven't produced a video in about two weeks. And that's because I've been following the Russia-Ukraine war and been distracted by that. And part of the reason is that one of my grandfathers was born outside Tarnopol. And so one eighth of my family is from what's now Ukraine. It was Austria at the time. And my great grandfather considered himself to be Austrian from the late 19th century. But I consider myself to be part Ukrainian. And so for me, the war has some personal elements. I know some Ukrainians. I've been to Ukraine to visit my family and do research on my, my heritage. And so I have a great deal of sympathy. I also know a lot of Russians. In the physics community, I communicate with a lot of Russians. And I met a number of conferences. I also met Russians when I lived in Bulgaria. And so I don't understand how this happens. The Russian people I've met have been nice for the most part. I mean, there were some anti-Americans in Bulgaria and other places, but it's always the same thing you hear everywhere. Oh, your, your people are great, but your politicians are terrible. And so the Russians I met who don't like America still like Americans and vice versa. Um, and so I don't understand the war atrocities. How can, how can people hate other people so much, especially when they have some common shared heritage? And that aside, in the news more recently, you may have heard that when the Russians retreated from Kyiv that some of the soldiers who had stayed in the Chernobyl area received excessive radiation exposure. And some of the radiation specialists, a couple I know or met, have said, oh, it's impossible. Well, actually it's not impossible. And the reason is, is because they buried so much material on site, so much radioactive material on site. And while it's true, if you had low levels of radiation exposure at the surface and there was no subsurface radioactive material, then, then it, it wouldn't make sense that anyone would have these high levels of exposure that would be dangerous to their health. But that's not what happened in Chernobyl in some of the areas, particularly around the Red Forest. And for those who aren't familiar, the Red Forest is an area in the direction the wind was blowing where when Chernobyl blew up. And the trees were covered in radioactive fallout. And there was so much radiation from this fallout that it killed the trees and turned them red. And the amount of radiation exposure it takes to kill trees is many times what it takes to kill humans. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I guess it's 
it has to be more than 10 times the exposure. So the amount of radioactive material that was on those trees is huge and highly dangerous. And so what the Soviets at the time decided to do is to cut down the trees and bury them. And, and in areas with contaminated soil, they would just cover it up. And some of the roadways, they would wash them down to keep the contamination levels low, but eventually they paved over the old roads in order to make them still be usable. So the situation in the more contaminated areas of Chernobyl near the plant in the direction of the Red Forest is much more complicated. We really don't even know how radioactive it is underground. But I came up with a sample. At, at the highest levels, you can have dose rates about one millisievert per hour. And keep in mind that natural dose rates are usually in the microsievert per hour range. So we have, and, and I'll say that when I was driving in the van, when we went close to the red forest, we were going through it on a road. I had a dosimeter up and was reading it and it went over 80 microsieverts per hour. And if it was 80 microsieverts per hour on the road, it was probably two or three times that in the field next to us. And by the way, there were fields where trees have never grown back, even though trees have flourished elsewhere in the exclusion zone. It's so radioactive and so toxic that trees don't grow in some patches of land in and around the Red Forest. So if you start at one millisievert, and I'd say one to, to point two would not surprise me at all in certain areas. The half thickness for cesium, cesium has a gamma that's over one MeV, and so its, it's intensity is reduced by about half in a meter of compact, compacted soil, or a meter of concrete, roughly. So using RADCOM math, we could say, okay, it doubles every meter. So at two meters, you could have four times the exposure if the dose is coming from below ground. And then there's also strontium-90, which is a beta emitter, which is more easily shielded by the soil. But if you dig into a layer of contamination from what came at the time of the explosion or a bunch of buried trees and tree debris, then it could be four millisieverts per hour at the surface. But because you have strontium-90 and other isotopes, you could be eight. And then now, instead of having standing on flat ground, which is like a, a plane source, you have walls beside you that have contamination in them. And the walls are contaminated, so you're being irradiated from all sides. So all of a sudden, you could have two or three times the exposure from that. So once again, using RADCON math, we could say 16 millisieverts. And for those who don't know, the term radiological controls is sometimes abbreviated to RADCON when you're working in the field as a health physicist. So you could have 16 millisieverts per hour. So in, inside a trench. Well, if you're in the trench for 24 hours a day, that's 384 millisieverts per day. And if you're there for two weeks, that's 5.4 sieverts of exposure, potentially. So five sieverts is known as the LD5030. 50% 50 of the people will die within 30 days. And this is only a very rough estimate. We don't know without particulars 
how much radiation exposure they were getting. Now that the Russians have left, the International Atomic Energy Agency has come in, and I'm sure they'll have a team of investigators make some measurements and do some tests and make a plan for recovering some of these areas or dealing with the radioactive waste somehow. And eventually they will produce a report and we'll get all the details. I don't know the details, I'm in the Philippines. But I just wanted to say it is plausible that some people did get these high levels of exposure. And it's also plausible that they inhaled radiation, radioactive dust that they dug up. And not only would they have had decay products like cesium-137 and strontium-90, which have a 30-year half-life and are the predominant sources of radiation exposure from the decay products. They could also have remnants of the fuel, transuranics that are produced within the fuel, because the entire core blew up and burned. So there could be fuel fragments, there could be powders and particulates from the fuel that are in the ground. So you could have things like plutonium-238 or americium-241 or lead-210 or polonium-210. All these types are alpha emitters. And while alpha emitters, the alpha particles can be shielded by a sheet of paper, once they get into your lungs or inside your body, if you ingest it, then you can get much higher levels of radiation exposure. And inhalation in the lungs can lead to lung cancer. So these people who got exposure need to be very carefully evaluated, they, where they can do a chest x-ray and do a full body burden analysis and do an analysis of the amount of radiation they've taken in. And if their exposure is over one millisieverts, they may need some advanced treatment. And the highest estimate I've heard is as many as 800 men were exposed, which is sad. And in part it happened, they're saying, because the Russians aren't teaching their Soviet history about Chernobyl because it was such a dismal failure of the Soviet system. The Soviets did just about everything wrong that you can imagine because the system's flawed. And unfortunately, the modern Russian system seems to be just as flawed. The system, system of government, I mean. And I'll leave it there. I, I don't want to turn this into a and anti-Russian rant because I'm not against the Russian people. I'm against Putin and I'm against what the military is doing to the civilians and the army of Ukraine. I had hoped that I would never see another war in Europe in my lifetime, but that didn't happen. So hopefully this is the last European war. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, even though it's a bit different. Thanks again for all my subscribers for helping me hit a thousand. And thanks for my Patreon supporters for supporting me. And you can also support me if you want to look into my research in quantum field theory and particle theory by buying one of my books. And so I'll just leave it at that. So thanks again.